Good morning, and thanks for coming out to New America today. It didn't snow, so that's good. That's one good thing to start with. Um, from the 1940s with the introduction of the GI Bill through the 1970s with the creation of Pell Grants, the federal government and states transformed American higher education from a bastion of privilege into a, uh, into a path to the American dream. But in the years since, this progress has stopped and in fact reversed itself. Instead of facilitating upward, upward mobility, it has instead been exacerbating inequality. Over the past 30 years, the purchasing power of the Pell Grant has plummeted, college prices have skyrocketed, states have disinvested from their public colleges and universities, and students are taking on more debt than they ever have before. Only one out of 10 of the country's low-income students earn a bachelor's degree by the age of 24, compared to three out of four of the wealthiest students. What's gone wrong and who's to blame? In her new book, Degrees of Inequality, How the Politics of Higher Education Sabotage the American Dream, Cornell University political scientist Suzanne Mettler argues that the crisis higher education is facing is fundamentally a result of political failure. She writes that our landmark higher education policies have ceased to func function effectively, and lawmakers consumed by uh, political polarization and plutocracy have neglected to maintain and update them. Today, we are lucky to have Suzanne Mettler with us to talk about the book and what the government can do to ensure that colleges continue to provide a window uh, to opportunity. Ms. Mettler is a professor of American institutions in the government department at Cornell University and a fellow at the Century Foundation, which is co-sponsoring this event. She is the author of three previous books, including Soldiers to Citizens, The GI Bill and the Making of the Greatest Generation, and The Submerged State, How Invisible Government Policies Undermine American Democracy. In addition to Ms. Mettler, we have two other distinguished panelists today, each of whom will respond to the book. First, we have a man who practically needs no introduction, the former Deputy Undersecretary of Education, Robert Shireman, who is now the Executive Director of the organization California Competes. And we have Francis E. Lee, a professor of government and politics at the University of Maryland. We've provided uh, more detailed bios that you can get at the front desk. I'm gonna start by asking Ms. Mettler a few questions about her book, and then I'll invite Bob and Francis to come up and join us to provide their perspectives. So without further ado, I'll get the conversation started. Thank you for that okay. introduction, okay. and it's lovely to be here. Great. Okay, can everybody hear me? Just want to make sure, okay. Um, so we first met uh, back in 2007 when you started working on this, uh, when you mm -hmm. started working on the book. And I've just been wondering, what took you so long? <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting to see this oh, every I year. See. Yeah. So it's going to be that kind of interview. Yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I've had a few other things going on. Uh -huh. I do teach classes and have lectures to write and grad students to advise and so on. Um, and I also wrote another book in the meanwhile that I hadn't been planning to write, The Submerged State. But, um, but honestly, uh, you know, for me, for, I'm sure that many people here in the room work day in and day out in this policy area in higher ed. Uh, and have a really deep knowledge of it. And here I was coming in to look at this, and with each book project I do, I always you know, decide at the outset what the scope of it will be, and I say to myself, how hard can that be? And then you, know, you get a ways into it, and you say, what have I done? Yeah. And that was particularly true in this case, because I had the idea that I should look at both what was happening at the national level and the state level, and both at spending and at regulatory policy. Uh, so it was a lot for me to try to get my head around, and it took me a while. So uh, why did you decide to pursue this book? Well, the uh, previous book that I had written was about the GI Bill, about World War II veterans. And uh, I was interested in not just the socioeconomic impact of the GI Bill, but also its impact on their participation as citizens in political organizations and politics. And I found that it had these very positive effects for that generation. And then if you look you know, across the middle of the 20th century, up through the development of the National Defense Education Act, Higher Education Act, and Pell Grants, we kept expanding access to college. And we had really tremendous success in that period in 
increasing college graduation rates across the income spectrum, beginning to do that after you know, a long period of time where higher education had really been about uh, being privileged. Uh, so then I began to wonder, well, what's happened since then? And so you know, I started to look at the indicators. And you see that, from, uh, that you know, we used to, just a few decades ago, be the international leader in college graduation rates, four-year degrees. But uh, about 10 or 11 countries leapfrogged over us. Then you look at who's getting four-year college degrees today in the United States. And um, what you see is that we're continuing to have increases for people who grew up in the top uh, income quarter. Um, where it's, you know, most everybody goes to college and about 71% get a four-year degree by age 24. But below that, the gains have been really unimpressive and particularly below median income. Uh, today, people below median income are barely more likely to get a four-year college degree than were people in those groups in the 1970s, which is really striking given that a college degree is more important than ever today. So today it's one in 10 people in the bottom income quarter and 15% in the next uh, quartile who get a four-year college degree by age 24. And then the plot thickens and things look even worse when you look at the value of those degrees because there's great variation depending upon what sector of, of colleges people attend and what particular institution within a sector. There are really different outcomes. We have a lot of talk today in the media about the problems of high tuition, and high student debt load. But the more I looked at this, the more I find that discussion really inadequate because it doesn't look at the particular sector and institution. And for, some, for many students, going to college is still a fabulous path to upward mobility. And uh, even if they take on some debt, they are getting a degree that makes that debt really worthwhile. They'll easily repay it because they'll get a good job, not to mention all the other things that we college professors hope they get out of a college degree. Um, but, uh, but it's really worthwhile. But then there are other students at the other end of the spectrum for whom they uh, go to college, take on student loan debt, and either don't graduate or get a degree that is not worthwhile. And so they can really end up worse off than if they'd never gone to college in the first place. So you put together all of these trends. And what I was beginning to see is that today we are really uh, reinforcing inequality through higher education. And so I wanted to know what's driving that. And you know, there's a lot of focus on what colleges and universities themselves do and about the increase in tuition. But it's really striking that in the United States, this has been an area where government has always been involved since the beginning, uh, from the Northwest Ordinance through the Morrill Act in the 20th century. So I wanted to know, what's government doing today? And that's really the puzzle that I started out with. And where do you think things have changed so, uh, in terms of the government and higher education? Yeah. What, what, are the, what areas are, where are the real problems? Yeah. Well, what I began to see is that today, we, well, I started out you know, thinking that I was a detective, and I had all of these culprits that I had to examine one by one and interrogate them. So was it something about interest groups? Was it something about the decline of civic organizations and so on? And as I examined these things, there was no, you know, there, each one gave some partial explanation, but none of them were telling me what the big story was that was going on. But the more I studied this policy area, I began to decide that what is going on in contemporary politics today, and not just in higher ed, but I think in lots of other policy areas, is that we have these existing policies that are now part of the political landscape. They were created in the past, many landmark policies. Uh, I came up with a term that I call the policy scape. So we have these existing policies that themselves can develop in all sorts of ways, some of which were intended and some which were unintended. Um, and they can generate all kinds of effects. And they require policy maintenance. A major task of contemporary governance is for lawmakers to, to monitor what's happening with these policies, to evaluate it, to assess issues of policy design and administration, and to maintain policies and make changes over time, as is necessary. And what I began to recognize is that 
Our current political circumstances are a disastrous combination with the demands of maintaining public policies. And so uh, there, you can see real variation over time in the capacity of the political system to do that kind of policy maintenance. And I think as recently as the uh, late 1980s and early 1990s, uh, we had a more conducive combination between our political system and that task than we do presently because of both the rise of partisan polarization and uh, what I'm calling plutocracy or plutocratic well, you, governance. You talk a lot in the book about polarization and plutocracy, and I'm yeah. wondering if you can define those terms a little more and, and explain yeah. what you mean. Yeah, that's right. So polarization is, is not a term that political scientists throw around lightly. <laughs> we uh, have quite a developing literature on this. And what we're talking about here is that if you look um, at members of Congress, the um, extent to which uh, Democrats and Republicans today in Congress overlap in their votes and switch sides, switch, go across the aisle, um, has become less and less and less than it was in the past. And part of this is driven by the decline of moderates, particularly in the Republican Party. You have greater homogeneity in voting patterns in each party across issues. Um, and, uh, and so the parties seem to be pulling away from, from each other. Um, so that's problematic for policy making, most often because it leads to stalemate. And as I looked at federal student aid, for example, what I found was that uh, in votes around even amendments to the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, that the gap between Democrats and Republicans, even on lots of small matters, has grown larger and larger and larger. And that indicates why we haven't had major new solutions to problems in higher education. If we're not even agreeing on those small issues, and we're not even finding the sort of political space in which to negotiate and deal with, with detailed, knotty kinds of issues that have to do with unintended consequences of policies and so on, it's not surprising. So that's a big problem of polarization. Um, and then by plutocracy, what I mean is that, you know, so here we have this environment where uh, the American uh, polity or, or citizens generally would like government to be doing lots of different things. Um, and most often we have stalemate because of polarization on lots of issues. But there are some interests that manage to rise above the fray and have their voices heard and get government to respond to them. And they are most often powerful vested interests. Uh, industry, for example, uh, in any particular area that managed to get government responsiveness. And that's been happening in higher education as well. And maybe you could build on that and say how that's been happening in higher education. Yeah. Well, the example that I uh, end up the book with, I, in the book I focus a lot on what was happening for a long time with bank-based student lending, mm -hmm. where those sorts of dynamics were occurring. And uh, so one of the really positive developments in recent years is the demise of, of bank-based student lending in 2010. But another area where this kind of plutocratic governance has been happening is with the rise of the for-profit colleges. Um, and so uh, this sector of higher education, uh, on the one hand, has, done, uh, has been the sector that really reaches out to low-income people. And, uh, you know, in traditional higher education, I will be the, the first to admit that we are very traditional, you know. <laughs> we tend to do things the same way we've always done them. And the for-profit sector came along and they said, we don't have to do it this way. We can find other ways to accommodate uh, people who have busy lives, they're already working, they have children to take care of, et cetera. And so they really uh, reached out to low-income students. The problem is that the outcomes are really poor. Um, most all of their students borrow, and not surprisingly, because they're, they're low-income people. But what these schools charge is very high tuition, much more than what uh, public universities and colleges charge on average. And the average student leaves with a very high degree of, of student loan debt. $33,000 is the median debt. And, uh, and then often end up worse off because they can't repay that student loan debt. They're evidently not getting the jobs that would enable them to repay it. Uh, and so they account, while they are 
now about 13% of all colleges and universities, they use about one in four federal student aid dollars in the Higher Education Act. And they uh, account for about 47% of all student loan defaults. The average student who goes to one within three years of graduating, if they do graduate uh, with a, a bachelor's degree, are in uh, student loan default. And so there's really poor outcomes. But these colleges are allowed to receive up to 90% of their revenues from the Higher Education Act's Title IV, that by itself. And that doesn't count what they're able to get from the GI Bill and, and other programs. Um, so they've become um, very um, politically active in trying to make their point to members of Congress, to, uh, and they've, they've managed to be quite successful in that. So uh, besides the rise of for-profits, you also mentioned some other uh, policy changes that have occurred over the last 30 years that you think are detrimental. Yeah. You want to mention those? Well, if I would speak first about federal student aid. On the one hand, we're spending more than ever today on federal student aid. Um, there are some problems I talk about in the book about policy design effects, how for long periods of time, Pell Grants were falling behind in uh, their value uh, whereas student loans were much more easily expanded. But since 2007, some of those problems have been addressed somewhat in terms of you know, Pell Grants being, being increased, although their purchasing power is much less than it was back in the 1970s because tuition has gone up so much more. But um, we've also, in the meanwhile, created new policies, uh, tuition relief through the tax system. And we keep doing more and more of this. And I think this is really problematic because it means lost revenues to the federal government, but in fact, uh, it does not seem to expand access to college uh, for, for students who wouldn't go otherwise because of the delivery system. So that's problematic. I also think we have other problems in federal student aid where we're not, the federal government is not holding either state governments or the nonprofit privates <coughs> accountable uh, in, all, in cases where they should be held accountable for their spending, and we could talk more about that if you're interested. The other area is the states and what's happening to public colleges and universities. And here, this is a major problem because 73% of American college students attend the public sector institutions. But uh, whereas this has always in the past been a major point of entry, particularly for low to middle income students, really students across the board, there, uh, Tuition has increased um, dramatically over time because states have really been pulling back. So uh, states now devote 26% uh, less per student than they did um, a couple of decades ago. And tuition, meanwhile, has gone up by about 113% because that's the way the, the colleges and universities can make up the difference. They've also had to do more with less, so they have more students in the classroom per faculty member. Um, more classes are being taught online as a way to save, uh, to save money. And th these things are really problematic for students from less advantaged backgrounds, and it really hurts college graduation rates. So um, you know, all of these are, are ways in which there are policy effects that need to be managed but it's not happening, and you get these unintended consequences. So um, you say uh, towards the end of the book that um, with our system of higher education in crisis, the core values and identity of the United States are at stake. Um, can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So uh, I think that it's a point in time where we need to step back and to think big about the purposes of higher education and about why government uh, should be having a role in it. Um, and as I was saying, we've done this throughout our history from the Northwest Ordinance on. Um, it's really striking how the US government thought that there were important national purposes that were served by some kind of investment in higher education. And today, we tend to talk about higher education as if it's only a private good, as if it's only something that, that benefits individuals that allows them to be better off. And it certainly does do that, should do that, if it's functioning well. But in addition to that, it serves broader public purposes. Uh, for example, for economic development in the United States, for, uh, for our economy to thrive, we need people who can be doing the kind of innovation and creativity 
that will help us to, to move forward economically. And also, uh, we've had rising economic inequality uh, since the 1970s. In order to be able to mitigate that with all of the social problems that emerge from that, uh, higher education is, is a really effective way to do that if it's functioning well. And then also to, I would say, reinvigorate democracy, to expand who's involved in American civic life that's critically important. My book on the GI Bill really um, made me very convinced of this, of how powerful this is, because veterans who used the GI Bill to get a college degree became uh, active in many more civic organizations and much more active in political activities in the immediate post-war era than veterans who were similarly situated but did not use the GI Bill. Uh, and uh, then I, I have a, a former student of mine, Deandra Rose, who's becoming a professor at Duke School of Public Policy, and she uh, looked at student aid policies for civilian students, the National Defense Education Act and components of the Higher Education Act, and found the same thing to be true, and it was particularly important for women who gained access to college because of Pell Grants and student loans, and they became more active in politics as a result. So you expand who's involved in politics, and that makes the United States live up to its ideals more fully. So in terms of solutions, one of the things I, I would get out of this is that you want to, you know, a pretty massive expansion of the Pell Grant program. I mean, it seems, and I'm wondering how realistic that really is in terms of, you know, uh, the funding that we have today. Yeah. That's actually not what I would lead with. Um, I ultimately, you know, in the final chapter, I talk what, about what we should do today. And I would say that we need to do all kinds of important things for policy management, first and foremost. So I think it's problematic that today one in four uh, student aid dollars is going to a sector that's not being very responsible and accountable for expanding opportunity. And so I think before we expand Pell Grants again, we've got to be able to manage that situation. So we've got to deal with the for-profit sector effectively. Um, we also need to look at the fact that there are um, states that have a perverse incentive to not invest in higher ed. Now, the states have competing demands that come from Medicaid, K-12 education, et cetera. And so they're investing in those things, which uh, you know, are mandatory spending. And they can leave higher education aside as discretionary spending and figure, if we do less, more federal student aid dollars will actually flow into the state. There's a perverse incentive. And I think we need to look at ways to require the states to have more maintenance of effort in order to get those Pell Grant dollars. And then I also think that looking at the nonprofit private institutions, there's real variation. There are some that um, will actually really help out students on Pell Grants and give them additional money out of their endowment and to really help make sure that they can make it uh, to graduation. But there are others that do very little for those students. So they borrow a lot of money, and they can end up borrowing too much and being in a bad situation. And meanwhile, they're using their own resources to try to game the rankings by giving more merit aid to students with high SAT scores so they'll rise up in the rankings. And I think that we need to find some way to hold them accountable as well. So then ultimately, I would say, yes, we should have more Pell Grant spending. But we want it used really effectively to be, you know, for uh, taxpayers want that. Taxpayers are, American citizens generally are supportive of investing in higher ed. They want uh, college to be a route to opportunity for people, but that money's got to be spent in a responsible way. So I think, you know, one criticism uh, that uh, has come up about the book um, that I've heard is that, it, that it, it goes a little easy on the colleges themselves. You know, mm -hmm. you talk about that tuition rising hasn't been the biggest problem. Um, and um, you know, to be fair to lawmakers, there is a frustration that every time that they raise the maximum Pell Grant, right. colleges raise their tuitions, and so there's no net gain um, over time. And so I think that this is something that both parties now are, you know, members from both parties are very frustrated with. Um, they feel like they're um, just going around in circles. And I'm wondering uh, what you think of that, yeah. how you would yeah. respond. Yeah. Well, there's certainly a, a lot of um, 
analysis by economists about you know, why has tuition gone up so much. Um, and there are, are reasons for that that I'll, I'll leave it to them to explain. But I think that uh, it is fair for the federal government to be asking universities and colleges to be accountable in these kinds of ways that I'm suggesting about you know, expanding opportunity um, to lower income students and to, to middle income students as well. What I'm really struck by as you look across American political history is how historically the federal government worked together as partners with the states and with private institutions. And whatever the goal was across different periods of time, they all worked together in concert to try to, um, to uh, get to those goals. And I think that we've somewhat lost sight of that. And actually, in recent years, since 2007, I think the federal government is doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. And the states and the institutions not uh, necessarily as much or not evenly across the board. And so I think we do need to find ways to hold them accountable. Okay. Um, in uh, the other um, criticism that I've seen that's come up um, uh, was from Andrew Kelly of the American Enterprise mm -hmm. Institute, and he questioned whether the bipartisan support for pro for for profits uh, in the House of Representatives was a question of uh, plutocracy or whether it was just plain old constituency influence. And I was wondering how you respond <laughs> to that um, question. Well, this is a a really um, interesting dynamic. I was quite fascinated to study the politics surrounding the for-profits because, uh, you know, they, um, they began to emerge right after, uh, well, there were some existing before the first GI Bill, but they really took off after the first GI Bill way back in the late 1940s. And immediately there were problems. And immediately there were uh, members of Congress who were saying, these institutions are milking the federal government. Um, and at that point in time, Democrats and Republicans got together and they created some changes for the Korean War GI Bill. So in not too long a period of time, they created some kind of a fix. And then uh, eventually civilian student aid is expanded to the for-profits and then problems emerged again. And this went on for some time. And uh, what's really interesting is if you look back at the 1980s, the um, complaints about the for-profits were coming um, from some Democrats and some Republicans, I'm particularly struck by uh, William Bennett, who was you know, Secretary of Education in the Reagan administration, who said uh, that these schools were acting as diploma mills that were taking advantage of poor people. Uh, and then the uh, President George H.W. Bush administration uh, really wanted to try to rein them in, and in, uh, legislation was introduced by Senators Bob Dole and Phil Graham in 1990 to try to regulate them in some way. Uh, Sam Nunn uh, had this, all these investigations that were done in 1990 about what was happening, and every single member of his committee, Democrat and Republican, signed uh, the re final report and said something has to be done. And finally, in 1992, you had some Democrats and Republicans together who enacted some modest regulations. Since then, things have changed. So, you know, it can't be just a matter of constituencies because the Republican Party, which used to be somewhat divided around them, um, is now very much lined up in support of them in both the House and Senate. And the way I interpret that is it's the dynamic of polarization. Polarization actually makes influence easier in some ways for interest groups because it means that instead of having to lobby every single member of Congress, they can go to the leadership. And once they get the leadership on board, then at least that party can step in line. And I think this is what's happened with the Republicans. And then they've been able to focus on the Democrats and getting enough Democratic votes in the House um, and they've done that strategically by um, hiring some former Democratic lawmakers and staffers from Capitol Hill and so on, and getting enough members of the House to, to step on board that they actually get votes in their, in their favor. So, you know, if you look at who the constituents are, this, it gets complicated because there's always the question of, is a, a member of Congress being responsive to the industry in their district, which you know the for-profits tend to be sprinkled across congressional districts, or are they being responsive to students in their district who are being taken advantage of? And I think different members of Congress are responsive, you know, to one or the other. 
Um, so it's, it's more complicated. It's, mm -hmm. um, I did find really fascinating in the book the talk about how the parties have changed over time. Not just the Republicans, but the Democrats as well. Um, you talk about how the Democrats were much more supportive of both the student loan industry and the for-profits back in the 80s and early 90s. Is it? Yeah, you know, I think it's, I see the interweaving of the dynamics of both polarization and plutocracy being at play. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and the Republicans have really lined up for this industry. So it's so interesting to me that as recently as the 1980s and early 90s, they, fiscal conservatism was motivating many in their party to, to take issue with the for-profits and to see this as wasted money as an industry that was really um, milking the federal government was a term that was often used. Uh, and now they've really vacillated away from that. And they will s say that they want to reward a sector of higher education that is uh, the private sector. But the problem with that when you look underneath it is that here you have an industry that on average, the average institution is uh, of the top 15 or so is getting 86% getting of its revenues from the federal government. So it doesn't seem so private. And then on the Democratic side, Democrats more traditionally were defenders of the for-profits, saw them as really helping low-income people. And um, there are some Democrats who will still make that argument today. And again, there it's problematic when you look at the actual outcomes for many low-income students. Um, but I think you see a divergence in the Senate and House now, where in the Senate, polarization is ruling. And so the Democrats are more and more lining up uh, in some opposition to the for-profits. But that's not happening in the House. OK, well, I think we're, I'm going to leave it there. And I'm going to call up our other panelists, uh, Bob Shireman and Francis Lee to hear uh, their views of the book and the issues uh, that the book raises. Uh, so Bob, do you want to start? Sure, be happy to start. Thank you so much for, uh, for your, your book. It was a, a fun and interesting read. Um, and I swear, I, I didn't go to the index first to see you know, <laughs> where I am in the book. Um, uh, but, uh, but it really made me think uh, not just about, help, help me to get out of just the education space and think about education policy from the perspective of what's been happening with politics generally in, in the country. And, and I, I want to start actually with where your conversation with Steve just sort of led to um, around uh, what, I what I wrote down while I was reading your book. Um, uh, I remember Alan Bloom's old, old uh, book, and so I, I um, the title that I came up with was The Closing of the Republican Mind. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought through kind of my time in mm -hmm. policy and thinking about how um, it used to be that you would have uh, in Congress some left-leaning principles and some right-leaning principles and then a discussion. Um, and then, of course, interest group politics that then affected the policy that came out. But the good thing was that you had the intersection, that you had that conversation between the left-leaning principles and the right-leaning principles, you know, maybe a market orientation versus an equity orientation. And while that was affected by the, by the interest group poli uh, politics, it, um, uh, it, the policy at least reflected that conversation and it, what, what it seems like has happened and I will be very interested in, in the political scientist sort of view of this is that those dynamics have changed where um, the interest group, especially on the Republican side, just kind of predetermined, there's, there's n less of an actually principled uh, right-leaning um, uh, element of the discussion in the first place, and so there's no really no discussion at all, and not a um, uh, that you know the compromise that results um, uh, doesn't have the benefit of the left and and the right having that uh, that kind of discussion. And so you, the book really helped me to kind of see uh, uh, how higher education policy. And I, it has felt like that's happening um, all over the country and in Congress on a lot of a lot of different issues. Um, 
A few other things I wanted to, to mention, really just adding to, your, adding to your story, you talk about the um, uh, quite progressive policies of the Obama administration uh, early on in the administration. And I just uh, thought useful to remind people that during the transition, um, most of the commentary was that, well, we don't really expect Obama to do much in higher education. It was not, uh, it was not much uh, a part of the political campaign that he launched. Um, and I wanted to, to throw out the possibility that part of the reason that Obama was able to propose such progressive higher education policy is that he d was not burdened by higher education or financial aid policies created in the heat of a campaign. And um, when, I, when um, folks running for office call me and, say, and ask me, well, so what should I be proposing in my campaign? I'd say, don't. Don't, <laughs> don't propose higher education policy in a campaign. Because if you poll things, and this is what happened with the Clinton and the tax credits. If you ask somebody, would, you know, should we have a tax credit for higher education, it sounds great. It sounds like it doesn't cost anything. Um, you know, it just sounds like a total, it sounds like apple pie, you know. This, and if you, uh, we did focus groups a number of years ago asking people, well, what should, be, what should the interest rate be on student loans? And just have, you know, have them write down, what do you think the interest rate should be? And almost everybody wrote zero or one percent, which from an economic standpoint makes no sense and basically would cause everyone to just want to take advantage of the program. Um, it's, it, and those are the kinds of policies that you get when, when you use polling to, to create higher education policy. So I think part of what created, uh, I, I'd say you had the, the, the uh, lack of uh, a uh, list of higher education policies that had been promised in the heat of the campaign and created by polling. Um, and then you had a very good candidate who really cared about higher education. And I remember um, early on, it may have been the transition or it may have been early on in the administration. Um, and I knew that, uh, you know, the things that you say during the campaign maybe get moderated some once you have to start uh, governing. And the president had said, uh, Obama, the candidate, had been um, very much in support of the, um, uh, the DREAM Act. And I was about to meet with some, I was working on the transition team, um, about to meet with some folks who I knew were going to ask me, so you know, what about the DREAM Act? And I um, emailed over to one of the, uh, to Heather Higginbottom, one of the primary campaign people, and said, you know, I'm going to meet with these folks. Can I, can I say we're 100% with you? We're right there. And I kind of thought, you know, I need to ask this because, um, I'll probably get a response that says, well, you know, we don't want to come out first with that. We'll get attacked as only care, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it would be sort of a triangulation thing. And the response I got back was, yes. It was just, go for it. And that, I mean, that's what actually made me think, I could actually work for this administration. <laughs> I could actually move back from California for a little while um, to work for this administration. So you had the combination of not being burdened by what was decided during a campaign um, uh, in terms of policy, and a, I think a good candidate who really cared about higher education and, and Pell Grants, um, and was you know, so bold as to, as you said, uh, propose a, a Pell Grant entitlement. Um, uh, you also make the good point in the book that it's not all about money and power, sometimes it's about strategy. And uh, you talk about the Sally May uh, alternative to, uh, to direct lending. And uh, I think you're right that part of the reason that the Sally May proposal didn't get anywhere was that they didn't, tr strategically, they had not brought in the, um, the nonprofit, uh, the nonprofit fun, uh, uh, loan companies. Um, uh, and we were hearing whispers all the time that, you know, that there's going to be a, a deal's going to be cut, that, that some mystery person in the White House, it, you know, it's just going to happen. Um, I think. Another reason the Sally May deal didn't happen was um, the details hadn't really been worked out. I mean, folks look at the proposal and trying to figure out how does this actually uh, how does this actually work. And um, I wanted to kind of bring to the book that issue of details because you say at one point in the book, and I wrote down uh, that uh, innov innovative ideas are rarely in short supply.
I think that's true, except that what is often in short supply are details. And um, even some of the ideas that you kind of end with in, uh, in the book, um, rewarding states for doing the right thing, um, rewarding institutions for a lot of Pell Grant recipients, the details about how to um, implement, how to actually design those sorts of things. They're good ideas, but it's in the details. Nobody has a detailed proposal. And figuring out the details actually accomplishes two things. One is it gives you something to actually propose rather than, um, uh, rather than just sort of pretending like you have an idea. But it also forces the other issue that you brought out, which is the unintended consequences, to think about, OK, well, if we design it this way, you start realizing when you work out the details. If we design it this way, we might be incentivizing these other kinds of things, and that's not necessarily um, a good thing. And so um, perhaps some of the fur, you know, further exploration, so where do you have details, where do you uh, not have details, um, that issue of details also kind of emerges around um, around some of the for-profit issues where there's a strategy about not having details. So the for-profit colleges like to say over and over again that they should be judged on outputs, outcomes rather than inputs, but they never actually propose any details on what those out how those outcomes should be measured. And when anybody actually does propose any details, they scream bloody murder and act like they're being attacked. Um, like, like is happening right now. Um, and so there's actually a strategy about acting like you have an idea, but then you have no details. And so you get the benefit of saying, well, they care about outcomes. But then, in fact, they have no, no proposal whatsoever and oppose anything that anybody has actually uh, proposed. So that difference between ideas and details, uh, I think, deserves uh, further exploration. I'll stop there. Okay. And uh, Francis? Thanks very much to the New America Foundation for hosting this um, event on Suzanne Mettler's important book. It's also the uh, Century Foundation as uh, well. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, the Century Foundation as well. I just want to take a few minutes to underscore a couple of the uh, very important books, uh, very important points in Suzanne's book, and then set them in the context of congressional politics uh, more generally. One of the really important points in the book is that policy doesn't remain static even when Congress is gridlocked. The effects of policy can change dramatically as a result of societal or economic changes, even when the laws remain the same. So gridlock just means undirected policy change. It doesn't mean a lack of change. So on the subject of direction, or lack thereof, it, it's unquestionably true that it's much harder for Congress to act today than it was in the past. Um, the U.S. system of government, with its many checks and balances and veto points, almost always requires bipartisanship to legislate. Most of the important laws that Congress has adopted, it has done so on the basis of large bipartisan majorities. So the problems that Congress faces today in getting bipartisan agreement are new to post-war American government. There should be no doubt that it's much harder today for politicians to work across party lines than it was in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. It's even harder than in the 80s and the 90s. I brought uh, some data for you to examine on a handout, uh, living up to the college professor stereotype, I guess. Uh, the party polarization can be seen via very simple indicators, so like something like party cohesion. Uh, the first figure that I uh, put on their handout displays the average Senate and uh, Senate Republican and Democratic Party unity um, between 1956 and 2010. Just looks at the that senators' average loyalty on uh, to their party on controversial issues, uh, broken out by Dem Democrats and Republicans separately. In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the typical senator voted with his party on controversial issues just over 60% of the time. In the 80s, just over 70% of the time. In the 90s, over 80% of the time. And since 2000, on average, above 87% of the time. Uh, the story is the same um, in the House, as is evident there in Figure 2. Conflict always slows Congress down, and partisan conflict most of all. 
And as partisan conflict spreads to more issues, the institution's gotten progressively more bogged down. As a consequence, the last Congress got almost nothing done. Uh, I also display a simple gauge of legislative productivity, the number of public laws passed in each Congress since 1951. With the passage of only 240 laws, the last Congress was the least productive of the whole time series, and the current Congress is on track to underperform the, the last. At the end of its first session, uh, it had passed fewer laws than did the 112th. It's been hard for Congress to act on anything. Even on low profile um, issues that have historically been bipartisan, like farm bills or the Postal Service or transportation policy, cybersecurity. Now, scholars and journalists normally attribute um, rising partisanship to ideological changes within the two parties. There's no question that each of the two parties have become more ideologically cohesive, more homogenous internally and that the preferences of Republicans and Democrats, uh, both at the level of members of Congress as well as party activists, um, are far more distinct from one another. But what's often overlooked in the focus on ideology is another factor that affects our com contemporary politics, and that's its ferocious party competitiveness. Um, the closeness of today's party competition is not normal in American politics. In fact, the last three decades have seen the longest period of near parity in party competition for control of national institutions since the Civil War. That's displayed in Figure 4, the bottom of the handout. It displays a simple index of two-party competition at the national level. The measure is just the average of the Democratic Party's share of the two-party vote for president, its share of House seats, and of, its Senate, se uh, and of Senate seats. So those three indicators average together the Democratic Party share. And then I just display the index's divergence from a 50-50 balance. So the closer the bar to zero, the more competitive the decade. Democratic-leaning eras are shown in um, blue, Republican-leaning eras in red, and the purple bars indicate evenly matched competition. As is uh, evident from this measure, our politics is distinctive today for its narrow and switching majorities. Nearly every recent election has held out the possibility of a shift in control of one institution or another, as we're looking to Senate elections uh, this fall. Looking back, the period most similar to the present was the Gilded Age, uh, 17, 1876 to 1896. This was another period of close and alternating party majorities in Congress, as well as a ferocious party conflict and low congressional productivity. These changed circumstances have had far-reaching effects on political incentives and on party politics. This increase in two-party competition for institutional con control fuels a more confrontational style of politics. The competitive context motivates politicians to show how and why they're different from and better than their party opponents. They have incentives to look for ways to confront the other side, to draw clear distinctions, the result is that the out party has more political incentive today not to compromise on issues because doing so blurs the differences between the parties to voters. But what it wants to do is to highlight the differences, to delegitimize the opposition, and make a case for a change in power. Newt Gingrich ally and House Republican Policy Committee Chairman Dick Cheney explained the logic behind the strategy in 1985. He said, confrontation fits our strategy. Polarization often has very beneficial results. If everything is handled through compromise and conciliation, if there are no real issues dividing us from the Democrats, why should the country change and make us the majority? More and more votes in Congress are staged for the purpose of highlighting the differences between the parties. Lots of votes today are taken on bills that no one has any illusion about becoming law. Uh, they're known as message votes. Message votes are not serious efforts to legislate. They're just public relations. Um, but public relations takes up an enormous amount of time in the contemporary Congress. So that's what I would say on the t subject of, um, of uh, polarization. And it's not just ideological polarization. It's also a reaction to a competitive context that's uh, uh, distinctly uh, intensive. <coughs> 
I also want to say a few words about the role of money in American politics. Um, the, the book traces the difficulties in higher education policy uh, to party polarization and to plutocracy, um, meaning the dominant influence of moneyed interests in policy making um, that, uh, that occurs. There, there's no question that money's become progressively more important in American politics as the cost of campaigns um, has exploded. But as with party polarization, part of the story is competition for control of institutions. Um, it's not that there are lots of competitive House and Senate seats. It's that campaigns for the handful of races that are competitive are flooded with money because the stakes are so high. The role of money is not necessarily always counterproductive in American politics. It obviously has a class bias and a strong one. Wealthy people fund campaigns. Uh, politics more grounded in civic organizations and social movements would likely be more in touch with the needs and wants of average Americans. But when it comes to the question of party polarization, moneyed interests can have a moderating effect, uh, reducing at least somewhat the incentives for endless partisan warfare. American business, writ large, obviously has a great deal at stake in the functioning and success of America's system of higher education. Generally speaking, business interests don't get that much benefit out of partisan gridlock uh, and uh, partisan warfare. Looking beyond higher education policy, um, the Chamber of Commerce would like to see more spending on infrastructure. Hospitals would like to see state governments accept the Medicaid expansion. Legislatures that can't compromise can't deliver for these interests. On the other side of the ledger, individual donors, as opposed to business interests, tend to be more ideological in their motivations. Individual donors are becoming a more important part of the campaign finance landscape. These are generally not middle class people. <laughs> Even small donors are not middle class people. Uh, but compared to corporate interests, individual donors are much more likely to donate for ideological reasons. Members of Congress with the sharpest ideological profiles have some of the best track records in raising money. The, the pressing need to seek and to raise money from this, sort, this source is probably an obstacle to constructive bipartisanship in government. So the effects of money on American policymaking are complicated. On the one hand, plutocracy means the government will be able to do at least some things, <laughs> albeit things that benefit American economic interests. What's good for American business isn't necessarily beneficial to the rest of the country, but it's not always harmful. Um, Suzanne Mettler makes the case that rent seeking has been particularly problematic in the higher education policy scape. Um, despite the propensity to rent seeking, politicians doing things that benefit American economic interests can sometimes be helpful to society at large. But when money means cultivating donations from individual donors who are consuming a steady diet of ideological news and opinion, it just reinforces all the uh, most counterproductive incentives in American politics right now. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for both of you. Um, Francis, do you, uh, one of the things that Suzanne argues in her book is that you know, she, she focuses on higher education, but she talks about how this is happening throughout different industries. Um, do you think that has polarization hurt um, other areas as much as higher education? Well, it's, it's certainly, a, the effects are spreading across issues. I mean, it's, it, there, used to, there used to be more issues that were somewhat immune from party politics. I mean, historically, appropriations within Congress tended to be an island of bipartisanship, even had a bipartisan staff. Um, and, but that's been, that came under pressure really starting in the 80s. It's it been, oh, you know, over time, you know, fewer and fewer issues are insulated from, uh, from party polarization. In, in, in political science, we'll say that more and more issues are getting absorbed into the single dimension that divides Republicans uh, from Democrats. So yes, this has effect. This affects all sorts of issues um, that extend beyond higher education. Making it, it, and, and the primary effect is just the difficulty of legislating altogether. Um, Bob, you were a staff member in Congress when I first met you uh, uh, back in the early 90s. Um, you worked for Paul Simon. Um, did, do you think that some of these factors were there then? Um, and also, I'm interested in the change in the parties over time. Um, have you seen that? Do you think that that is also uh, true, that the Democrats have shifted as well? 
Um, well, I definitely recognize, I read the book, definitely recognize the, the dynamics and the change in dynamics and sort of that feel of, of um, what felt like, at least in the early 90s, the ability to have, to, to have a discussion um, and, uh, and to maybe reach a compromise, maybe not reach a compromise, but at least it was a rational discussion based on um, theories and proposals and ideas. Um, and it has felt more and more like um, uh, you're walking into a buzzsaw where the folks on the other side of the aisle are uh, required to just um, uh, you know, slash and burn and uh, not, have, not have an actual discussion. And, and that does feel like it has changed. Um, uh, that I'd also recognized the um, in some changes on the um, Democratic side. Uh, certainly, the inclination in the early '90s among Republicans and Democrats was let's keep peace with the banks, um, uh, and at least as far as the uh, education committees uh, went. Um, uh, let's not upset the for-profit colleges too much. And I would say even, even Senator Simon was there and almost got into trouble around that. Um, and, um, and that has shifted. I, mean, I think I still see that in the Democratic Party, but the, some of the leadership, at least in the Senate, um, has, uh, has you know, become more pointed in its um, criticisms of the, of the for-profits in ways that uh, were not the case in the early 90s. Um, <clears throat> Suzanne, um, in the book you talk about, you know, one area where plutocracy didn't occur was when there was actually student loan reform um, and they switched from uh, guaranteed lending to uh, direct lending. Um, but you talk about the fact that the polarization and the fact that it was an all democratic reform um, has hurt it. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, first, I'd, I'd just like to say that when I started working on this book, I did not foresee that we were going to be terminating bank-based lending because, you know, it had been such a long struggle from when these ideas emerged um, in a bipartisan way in the, the late 1980s um, for direct lending. And then I looked at the, when Clinton introduces it, um, I see that as a moment when polarization really became exacerbated, when suddenly the waters parted and, and people were uh, lining up on either side depending upon their party. And so for a long time, um, that sort of dynamic then seemed in place and plutocracy was operating as well because there was all of this you know, campaign spending and lobbying being done by the, the banks and uh, by Sally May and so on and trying to, to prevent reform from happening. But then um, what was really surprising to me when I'm in the course of writing this book was all of a sudden um, change became possible. And you know, so here's sort of the hopeful note of the book is that change still can occur. We're not just bound to what political scientists will call path dependency, where you get going down a certain path and then it becomes reinforced again yeah. and again and again. That you can actually have a set of political circumstances that line up and make change possible. And so that did happen um, you know, around uh, bank-based lending. But I think that, uh, to get to your real question, that polarization does even hurt the shape that these reforms take. Um, and so, you know, in that instance, um, it was really intriguing to me. I remember uh, interviewing a Republican staffer um, a on the Hill and saying, well, why didn't you put forward some kind of a, an alternative proposal that, that you could have been happy with and gotten behind? And this individual said to me, philosophically, we were not on board and we just couldn't go there. You know, we knew that the math didn't work for the Sally May proposal, but we, we didn't want to be part of something else. We wanted just bank-based lending. That was no longer economically feasible. So they didn't engage in it. And so what's really left out is what Bob is talking about, the attention to the details that takes bipartisanship. I think that 
higher education, it's, it's so striking to see higher education become really subject to polarization because historically it's been an area with greater bipartisanship and where people have been willing to get together and talk about the details, even if they had very different points of view about them, to hear each other out. And I think through that deliberation, you come up with a better product. Um, you know, it's illustrated by an, another set of policies we haven't talked about, and that is uh, the contemporary GI Bill. So if you go back to the 1980s, there was real bipartisanship that happened around the creation of the Montgomery GI Bill at that point in time. It took seven years, but there was real bipartisan effort to come up with a good plan. And then that became outdated, outmoded, and it needed to be revitalized, and a long time went by before that happened. Finally, Senator Jim Webb uh, led the effort for that, for, for what became the post-9-11 GI Bill. But it happened in this really different political environment and with much less deliberation about the details. And so then it no sooner was it enacted when it had all sorts of problems with administration because it's just the kind of thing that, you know, if there'd been more negotiation ahead of time and deliberation, some of those things could have been foreseen and worked out. And on that one, there wasn't even discussion among Democrats of different committees. I mean, there was no, between the Education Committee and the, and the um, Committee, the Veterans Committee, there wasn't any communication right. either. <laughs> so, so it wasn't just between Republicans and right. Democrats. Well, it, I think you know what <clears throat> happens is that people see the political moment. Okay, we have an opening to get right. this done, and then it gets rammed yeah, through absolutely. in the context of polarization because right. you think, Don't well, otherwise all those details. that right. window <laughs> is going to shut, and we will have missed the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I think it's true. Well, I think I'm going to open it up to the room to see if uh, you guys have questions for the panel. Uh, wow, we've got some. Um, why don't I start with you over here? Yep. Hi. Uh, we, my we, name is Ken Sarger. I happen to be a professor at a regional state university. Oh. A re well, I probably don't need this, but yeah. at a regional state university in the Midwest. And, um, you know, our faculty are earning less now than they earned in real dollars in 1980. Our students, in fact, um, our students are on the list of the students who graduate from public universities with the highest amount of debt in the country. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's disheartening to sit here and hear that some of the problems, I mean, we're facing, you know, enormous cuts in state spending. Um, tuition, raising tuition is sort of the only way that the university can manage to meet its expenditures. Um, it's disheartening to sit here and hear that the problem is really over on the hill, um, that it's, you know, that my students who couldn't, can't afford to have an internship in Washington, D.C. that's unpaid, um, you know, are being basically facing this because of things over on the hill. So my question is, and I, I haven't read the book yet, but um, my question is, what should the rank and file do? Like, what do you recommend the students, the uh, professors at these universities who care deeply about higher education do to grease the wheels, to, um, you know, help uh, this situation do better for those who are simply trying to get this access. And let me just point out that the regional state university has been the point of the greatest amount of access for people from underrepresented groups, right? Um, so anyhow, thanks. Thank you so much for your question, and I'm glad you're here. And I think that it's, you know, institutions like yours that have been particularly important historically for providing opportunity to people. And these are precisely the institutions that we ought to be concerned about and ought to be trying to set things right so that students can attend them without going into such, uh, such debt um, and so that, um, that things are, are functioning better than they are presently. Um, I've been talking a lot about the federal government, but in the book I also address, you know, state governments and their pulling away from supporting these institutions. Um, in the middle of the 20th century, not only was the federal government investing in uh, new kinds of student aid, but meanwhile the states were redoubling their efforts and putting huge investments into public universities and colleges. And they continued to do so even after the federal government began to pull back in the 1980s. But it's really been since the early 90s that, uh, at least nationwide in, in the aggregate, that uh, the states have been 
pulling back and doing less. And so I like you know, the direction of your question, asking about what can people do generally? Because that's really the note I end up on at the end of the book. Um, the American public gets very much left out of these discussions. And there's a little bit of a tension between the very good point that Bob makes, that the details matter, and engaging the American public. I mean, higher ed policy quickly gets into down in the weeds, kind of wonky kinds of details. And that's not engaging to the public generally. Um, the most active organizations speaking on students' behalf are the organizations representing universities and colleges. But their interests are not always the same as the American public at large and people who have not become college students. Um, and so the question is really how to engage the broader public around these issues. And one of the things that I uh, tell my students is that the period in time when lawmakers were most responsive to young people was when young people were more active in politics. If you look at the 1960s and 1970s, young people were much more active not only in voting but in a whole array of political activities. And then that declined during the 1980s, most of the 1990s. Um, and it, since 2000, there's been an uptick of young people's involvement in uh, political participation in the 2004, 2006, 2008 elections. And I think it's not an accident that lawmakers have become more responsive at the national level in increasing Pell Grants since that time and so on. I mean, this is how representative democracy works, that when people speak with a louder voice and make their interests known, that elected officials are more responsive. Uh, and so trying to revitalize that kind of civic engagement more broadly um, is really important. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, I want to underscore the book has some really useful data and discussion around the decline of state aid in higher ed and some of the dynamics around that. Um, and um, the idea of rewarding states and figuring out how to incentivize uh, state support of higher education is absolutely critical. Um, but somebody's got to put together the details and then rally a coalition around supporting it. And um, uh, unfortunately, that hasn't happened. Um, and um, uh, but it would, I think that's a really important uh, step that needs to be taken. Okay. Maybe a bit of a focus on state government also would be a, a, a appropriate here. It's hard to be optimistic when you look at the constellation of, of political incentives surrounding, uh, surrounding Congress itself. And this point about details versus what, it, what speaks to the broad public, I think also intersects with the way in which party competition uh, uh, leads Congress to pay less attention to details. I mean, these message votes are designed for public consumption. They're not serious. They lack details. They're, they're not staffed out. Th these are not real policy proposals. They just look like them. And so when, when you're engaging in campaigning instead of efforts to govern, then the details don't matter as much. And so we're seeing less of a focus on details because of the, 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 the continuous and pressures of campaign incentives. OK, back there. Um, right. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about what you, your thoughts on the Obama administration's um, proposals to sort of reform uh, how federal student loan aid is, is given to schools, you know, talking about using metrics like gainful employment. I'm curious about your thoughts both in general, but also any ideas you might have about what unintended consequences might result? So for example, Dr. Mettler, you talked about you know, universities sort of trying to game this, uh, certain metrics in terms of things like rankings and that sort of thing. So I, I wonder about you know, if new metrics were, were tied to, to things like uh, federal student loans, like what, what results you might, might think would happen. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you for your question about these, uh, the proposed rankings. Um, I imagine there are a lot of you in the room who are spending a lot of time thinking about these rankings and uh, are imagining the unintended consequences that might emerge from them. And, um, and I should say, you know, that's not my expertise and I, I, I don't really go there in the final chapter, but really make more calls more broadly about how we need to, to focus on um, higher ed in a new, in a new way. Um, but I do think, uh, on, the, on the one hand, 
I think the rankings are um, motivated by the right things in that, as I've been saying, we need to, the federal government, it's right for the federal government to hold institutions across sectors accountable because they get a lot of federal student aid dollars and because they're part of a big national mission to uh, extend higher education. And so that's appropriate. Um, how it's done, the details, of course, is where it gets complicated. And we need to think about which kinds of indicators can we actually measure in a meaningful way, uh, and so on. So my, my suggestion on ratings was um, uh, just basically have a, have a warning. Have a warning if a college doesn't reveal who its faculty are. Have a warning if a college refuses to release to the public its accreditation uh, self-study and uh, a visiting team report. And have a warning if someone is being asked to pay tuition that is more than double the amount that the institution spends on instruction, which is a data point that exists right now and the federal government has it. So that's what I'd do tomorrow. Over here. Thank you very much. Actually, it'd be great if people say where they're from. Sure. Uh, that before. Good, this is on. Uh, Fred Winter from F.A. Winter Associates. Uh, while we're talking here, the Department of Education is preparing the finalization of the guidelines for a new $75 million funding opportunity called First in the World, designed to focus on college success, which is understood pretty much to be college completion. What are your fears that the new funding opportunity might do that would reinforce the negative trends that you're seeing? What are your hopes that it might include that would reverse them? Thank you for the question, though. I have to confess I'm not familiar with this particular initiative. Uh, so I can't speak to that in no, particular. No one is yet. It's brand new. Oh, I see. So you've got $75 million. Yeah. What are you going to do to uh -huh. fix the problem? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, um, we need funding, but we have to be careful about how we spend it. And so I would want to look carefully again at, those, at the details and uh, looking at spending it at institutions that have a good track record for college completion, and then for institutions that don't, looking at what the federal government can do to try to incentivize them to find better college completion rates. Um, we haven't mentioned at all community colleges uh, today. And uh, often students who are going to for-profit colleges could be getting the same training, uh, same preparation for gainful employment, uh, at a community college at a much lower price and without becoming so indebted. Um, but community colleges have been dealing with uh, very uh, scarce resources uh, and uh, I think that we really ought to be looking for ways. There were some proposals that had been floated around in 2009 and 2010 that ultimately didn't become part of the student aid bill that was enacted that could have re uh, done more to uh, incentivize the community colleges to experiment with uh, new approaches that are, are great for college completion rates. I think we ought to be looking more at strategies that help uh, ensure that then students transfer on to go and, and finish their bachelor's degree and so on. Okay. Uh, right, right there. So hi, uh, Richard Kallenberg with the Century Foundation. So this is the terrific panel. Um, it, it's a little discouraging though, of course, that, that there are, uh, we haven't been able to make efforts uh, successful in, in a number of different areas with the tax credits, uh, the for-profits, the state expenditures on higher education. And, and Bob, your, your success is kind of the one shining example of, of uh, where everything came together. And uh, we obviously had control, Democrats had control of both houses of Congress and, uh, and we had Bob, who was fighting for direct lending. But I'm wondering, Suzanne, if you can talk about, or I guess all the panelists, if you could talk about uh, what lessons there are there and how they could translate, for the how the success in the direct lending could translate into, into those other three areas. Um, well, uh, so, so I do I have a, a chapter in the book that I call Opportune Moments. And this is about uh, what happened in 2009 and 2010 that, uh, that made things come together 
after long efforts to move to 100% direct lending, what helped it to happen. Um, so one of the things that really helped to make this happen, of course, was um, that the bank-based lending was no longer financially feasible, and that became very clear after the economic downturn. And then there was new political will and new political leadership um, because of the Obama administration's efforts um, and, uh, and the Democratic majorities that were on board with, with that on the Hill. Uh, and there had also been uh, revelatory stories in the media that had made the public more aware of the problems that were happening with bank-based lending. So all of those things came together. And we sort of, we know in political science that when, you know, at what we call a, a policy window, a window of opportunity opens, it's usually uh, some of those kinds of circumstances coming together of changes in social and economic and political circumstances that, that line up. Um, so the question is, moving forward, how do you try to um, create that sort of window of opportunity? Um, I really think that uh, higher education is an area that, you know, as I've said, not so long ago we had bipartisan uh, willingness to work together on issues, and that we ought to be able to regain that. It shouldn't be as hard as it might be around some other issue areas, and that the uh, need to do so is really compelling. And so that has to be uh, a first step, engaging the broader public uh, as well, critically important. And I think uh, we can't underestimate how important it is for the public to understand more broadly what's going on in these issues that for, I'm sure people in this room are very well aware of many of these trends I've spoken about. But when I go around the country and talk about this, people's jaws drop open when they hear some of the statistics that I'm giving you. And it's really news to people. And so I, I think the word hasn't gotten out. I guess one point I would make is that it's important for people in the policy community to keep working because when those policy windows open, they're not open for very long. And if you don't have ideas that are ready to go, you can't take advantage of them. So to keep pressing on in spite of depressing circumstances uh, so that you are ready. Can I repeat exactly that? <laughs> so that is the number one issue is that so many folks working in policy just kind of are sitting and going, gosh, I hope things will get better because then we'll get some, then maybe we can work on good policy. Then when the window opens, and you don't, you don't open the window. The window opens. You can't predict when the window is going to be open. The people with ready policy proposals are the ones that can get them through that window of, of opportunity. And a ready policy proposal means details. It means a coalition. It means you know, going around to the folks who might support it. When, they, and when at the Institute for College Access and Success in 2005, when we launched, we went around all the folks in one DuPont circle and said, we, we want to improve income. We want to make an income-based repayment program that, that works a lot better. And basically, almost every person we talked to said, eh, you know, the timing isn't good and, and too bad and you probably can't get, you know, you can't get anything done, you know, all that. And they just said, you know, why bother? We worked on it anyway and we built a coalition around it. And within two years, a window of opportunity that no one could have predicted opened up, and there, and there it went. And we've ever since then been building on that. And um, so even if things look bleak, work on the details, build the coalition, um, uh, figure it out so that when the window opens, you can go for it. OK. More questions? Mark? Hi, I'm Mark Schmidt. I run the um, political reform program here at New America. Um, one, one of the reasons I got interested in issues of political reform was from working on the Hill in the early 90s on the kind of periphery of the direct lending fights that Bob was the, the leader on and seeing, how the, seeing the dynamics of the political debate. So it's great to see where it's come. I think it's fascinating to think, it, to think of these issues in terms of something that was a success and a breakthrough uh, in this political climate. I mean, we're so used to, you know, we study a lot of failure. Um, and this is a reminder of something where I think we all f assumed that there was going to be kind of a long stalemate around the for-profits and, for and the student loan industry. Uh, it's fascinating how it broke through. Um, but I'm struck by the fact that there's a whole other dimension of, of higher education that seems to me 
more powerful and more influential than ever, which is really just the large pro public and private universities with enormous lobbying presences here in Washington, not much challenge to their administrative costs, the, you know, their continual, you know, huge federal funding for those, for those institutions. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about, you know, really what you call one DuPont circle. Um, any, any possibility of a breakthrough on really thinking about cost and quality of, of, of higher ed and the, and the federal role out beyond the for-profits and the, and the bank-based student loan lenders? Um, this, thank you for your question. Uh, so uh, in the book, I, I touch on those kinds of issues lightly. I do think that um, the organizations that are part of One DuPont Circle, which represent both the, the public and private nonprofit institutions or traditional higher education, um, you know, they can have um, priorities that overlap with those of the American public broadly, but in the main, what they exist to do is to protect their institutions. Um, and uh, so they'll be in, in favor of something if, if it does that. Um, and so there are probably ways in which, you know, they need to be challenged and that more broadly the institutions they represent need to be challenged. And, uh, and that's where I think that um, it's appropriate for the federal government to be looking at, uh, you know, the real variation that exists in the degree to which uh, different states run their public universities and colleges in ways that expand access or fails to do so, and that ex expand graduation rates among people across the income spectrum or fails to do so, and the same for the private nonprofits. Uh, so, uh, you know, that invites a discussion about all sorts of, of details, and, and it's not where I go in the book, but I think that needs to happen. Bob, do you have anything? Just a reminder that most people are attending regional public universities that are not spending any more on a per student basis than they spent 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and I go back and forth on how much to worry about the sort of top 2% problem, which uh, a lot of you know, the New York Times reader worries about college are about colleges that most people don't go to, you know, the cost of the fact that they're being asked to pay forty-five, fifty thousand dollars in tuition at Princeton. In some in some ways, I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care if they're, if they're happy to pay fifty thousand dollars in tuition. Why do I care? On the other hand, I do care about the fact that Princeton's not enrolling very many low-income students. Or I probably should have picked a different one. Uh, Princeton might be better. I'm not sure. But in any case. Um, uh, in, in any case, I, I think those are where um, uh, certainly some policies could be developed around um, uh, especially some of the most uh, selective uh, public and private institutions that are spending enormous amounts per student and are not, en not enrolling America. Uh, they are very elite. Um, and uh, that's where we need some specifics, because I, I think it is an issue that a lot of people care about. At the same time, I don't want to get tied up. I, I don't think 100%, I think sometimes too much of the discussion is about that, rather than where most people actually go. Any more questions? Okay, over here. Brian Newman, uh, Abington Strategies. Uh, Dr. Mettler, um, I wonder if you can offer some thoughts on uh, state uh, initiatives, recent state initiatives, particularly in Oregon and Tennessee, uh, to provide free tuition um, at some post-secondary institutions in those states. Right. Um, yeah, so thank you for your question. Uh, and I know that you know, some states are considering this or moving in the direction of no public tuition. Um, and you know, in the main, this is what we uh, would be really fantastic for low-income students would be to have those kinds of opportunities um, in, uh, in institutions where they're able to get a good education. Um, I think that uh, you know, with any policy proposal, one needs to look at, to think, try to think ahead about are there unintended consequences here? Are there things about this that could be 
um, problematic. Um, and so, you know, that, that's not something that I've got given a lot of thought to. But uh, my overall message of this book is that we ought to be thinking creatively outside of the box about solutions like that, but that we also should subject them to the kinds of um, questions that Bob is mentioning about being careful about the details and thinking about issues of policy delivery and, and administration. Okay, any, any more questions? Well, I wanna thank everyone for coming out today. Uh, it's been a great panel, and I also wanna encourage people to, uh, to uh, take a look at Suzanne's book. They're selling it right outside here. And thank you very much for my panel. Thank, thank you. you so much, thank Steve. You.